past is never dead. It's not even past. Chapter 30, the recent past. The last several decades of American history, which I stand witness to, have culminated in this present, an era of technological innovation and rapid cultural growth, but also one of stark partisan division, racial and ethnic tension, gender debates and divides, slowing economic growth, widespread military confrontations, and pervasive anxieties about the future of the United States. Through boom and bust, national tragedy, uh, both internal and external strife, a new chapter of American history in this moment is busily being written. The conservative Reagan revolution lingered over the presidential election of uh, 1988. Uh, Reagan's vice president, the son of US Senator from Con uh, Connecticut, George H.W. Bush, 41, he was a World War II veteran, president of a successful oil company out in Texas, chair of the RNC, Republican National Committee, and the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA. Bush defeated Dukakis to win the presidency in 1988, signaling Americans' continued embrace of Reagan's conservative programs, and offering further evidence of the utter disarray that now plagued the Democratic Party. American liberalism, so stunningly triumphant in the 1960s with LBJ, was now in full retreat. It was still, as one historian put it, the age of Reagan. The Soviet bloc countries crumbled under Bush's tenure, devastated by a stagnant economy, mired in a costly and disastrous war in Afghanistan, confronted with dissident factions in Eastern Europe, and rocked by internal dissent, the Soviet Union simply fell apart. Eastern bloc nations turned against their communist organizations and declared their independence from the Soviet Union. Mikhail Gorbachev let them go. Soon, the Soviet Union unraveled. On December 25th, Christmas Day of 1991, Gorbachev resigned his office, declaring that the Soviet Union no longer existed. At the Kremlin, Russia's center of government, the new tricolor flag of the Russian Federation was raised. The dissolution of the Soviet Union left the United States as the world's only remaining post-war superpower. Global capitalism seemed triumphant. Observers wondered if some final stage of history had been reached, if the old battles had ended and a new global consensus built around peace and open markets would reign forever. What we may be witnessing was not just the end of the Cold War or the passing of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. The famous quote from the era. Assets in Eastern Europe were privatized and auctioned off as newly independent countries introduced market economies. New markets were rising in Southeast Asia and Eastern Europe. India, for instance, began liberalizing its economic laws and opening itself up to international investment as early as 1991. China's economic reforms, advanced by Chairman Deng Xiaoping and his handpicked successors, accelerated as privatization and foreign investment proceeded. America, as it seemed, had triumphed over the 20th century itself. The post-Cold War world would not be without international conflict. When Iraq invaded the small but oil-rich country nation of Kuwait, in 1990, Congress granted President Bush, H.W. Bush, approval to intervene. The United States laid the groundwork for the intervention, um, Operation Desert Shield, in August, and commenced combat operations in Operation Desert Storm. Collectively, it's known as the, the Gulf War, first Gulf War. With the memories of Vietnam still fresh, many Americans were hesitant to support military action that could expand into a protracted war or long-term commitment of troops. But the Gulf War was a swift uh, win for the United States. New technologies, including laser-guided precision bombing, amazed Americans who could now watch 24-7 coverage of the war on the cable news network, or CNN. The Iraqi army splintered after only 100 uh, hours of ground combat. President Bush and his advisors opted not to pursue war into Baghdad and risk an occupation uh, and an insurgency. And so the war was won in Iraq. The soldiers of Iraq uh, left Kuwait. Many wondered if the ghosts of Vietnam had finally been exercised. President Bush's popularity seemed to suggest an easy re-election in 1992, but Bush still had not won over the new right. He faced a primary challenge from political commentator Pat Buchanan, a former Reagan and Nixon White House advisor, who cast Bush as a moderate and as, unworthy, uh, as an unworthy steward of the conservative movement within the Republican Party. Still thinking that Bush would be unbeatable in 1992, many prominent Democrats passed on a chance to run. And the Democratic Party nominated a relative unknown, Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton. Dogged by charges of marital infidelity and draft dodging during the Vietnam War, Clinton was a consummate politician with enormous charisma and a skilled political team. He framed himself as a new Democrat, a centrist opposed 
uh, a centrist open, excuse me, to free trade, tax cuts, and welfare reform, which we'll get to. 22 years younger than Bush, he was also the first baby boomer uh, to make a serious run in the presidency. Clinton presented the campaign as a generational choice. During the campaign, he appeared on MTV. He played the saxophone on the Arsenio, uh, Arsenio Hall show. I remember that. He promised African-Americans he'd be the first black president, and he told moderate voters that he could offer the United States a new way forward. Bush ran on his experience and against Clinton's moral failings. The GOP convention in Houston that summer featured speeches from Pat Buchanan and religious leader Pat Robertson decrying the moral uh, uh, decay plaguing American life. Clinton was denounced as a social liberal who would weaken the American family through both his policies and his individual moral character. Uh, an idea that I don't have up here, but it's pretty critical, is cult the culture wars. These predate the 1990s, but these really take off. And we're going to see this with when we start talking about things like same-sex marriage and don't ask, don't tell. Despite that, despite the Republican opposition, Clinton was able to convince voters that his moderated Southern brand of liberalism would be more effective than the moderate conservatism of George H.W. Bush. Clinton surprisingly won the 1992 presidential election, perhaps an indirect result of the independent candidate Ross Perot, uh, the oil man from Texas, his enormous impact on the race. He got something like 18% of the popular vote. Still, the Reagan revolution reigned. Clinton and his running mate, Tennessee Senator Al Gore Jr. Where is old Al Gore? There he is, Al Gore. They were both moderate Southerners and they promised a new path forward from the old liberalism of the 1970s and 80s. They were Democrats, but conservative Democrats, so-called new Democrats. And they promised a, a move away from all the Democratic losses of the 70s and 80s. In his first term, Bill Clinton pushed liberal policies like universal health care, an effort led by First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton. It failed to gain even modest support. And formal acceptance of gays in the military through the don't ask, don't tell policy his administration put into the United States military. Don't tell anyone you're gay. Don't ask anyone if they're gay. Gays can serve only under that arrangement. Uh, these initiatives upset conservatives uh, of all political persuasions. However, his agenda also included unconventional priorities for a Democrat, like welfare reform and completion of the North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, in, a, in an effort to abolish trade barriers between the United States, Mexico, and Canada. His moves to reform welfare, open trade, and deregulate financial markets were particular hallmarks of Clinton's third way, a new democratic uh, embrace of heretofore conservative policies. If NAFTA opened American borders to goods and services, people still navigated strict legal barriers to immigration. Policymakers believe that free trade would create jobs and wealth that would incentivize Mexican workers to stay home. If we can trade with Mexico, perhaps we won't have an illegal immigration issue. And yet multitudes continued to leave for uh, opportunities in El Norte, the North. The 90s proved that prohibiting illegal immigration was, if not impossible, exceedingly difficult. Poverty, political corruption, violence, and hopes for a better life in the U.S. or simply higher wages continued to lure immigrants across the border. Between 1990 and 2010, 20 years, the number of undocumented immigrants within the United States tripled from 3.5 million to 11.2 million. The midterm congressional elections of 1994 were a disaster for the Democrats who lost the House of Representatives for the first time since 1952. Congressional Republicans led by uh, Georgia Congressman Newt Gingrich offered a policy agenda they called the Contract with America. So I mentioned Newt Gingrich is still around in uh, Republican politics and his Contract with America. This is my era of, uh, or area of uh, thesis, uh, thesis research actually. Um, Republican candidates from around the country gathered on the steps of the Capitol to pledge their commitment to a conservative legislative blueprint uh, to be enacted if the GOP or the Republican Party won control of the House in that election. That strategy worked. Reagan's appeal had gradually put into play all sorts of Southern districts that had been solidly blue seats since before the Civil War, cemented again during the Great Depression. The only thing that begins to turn the tide is the Great Society programs and the Civil Rights Movement where the South, which was formerly Democratic, starts to turn red, and now we'll see this cemented really in 1994. Social conservatives were mobilized by an energized group of religious activists, especially the Christian Coalition, led by Pat Robertson and Ralph Reed. Robertson, who I've mentioned multiple times throughout these lectures, uh, was a television minister and entrepreneur whose 19, uh, 1988 long shot run at the Republican presidential nomination brought him a massive mailing list. 
and a network of religiously motivated voters from around the country. From the, that mailing list, the Christian coalition organized around the country seeking to influence politics on the local and national level, sending people VHS tapes and all sorts of mailers trying to convince them uh, to switch to be Republicans. In 1998, the generational contest played out again when the Republicans nominated another aging war hero, Senator Bob Dole of Kansas. But Clinton again won the election, becoming the first Democrat to serve back-to-back -back terms since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He was aided in part by an amelioration of conservatives by his signing of the welfare reform legislation, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act of 1996. You can just call it welfare reform in 1996, which decreased welfare benefits restricted eligibility and turned over many responsibilities to the states for administering welfare. In 1994, I don't mention it in my lecture at all, um, but there's also a crime bill, uh, which is very popular with Americans. So Democrats embrace uh, much of what conservatives had been sort of clamoring for, and they called it their own, and they used it to win political advantage throughout the 1990s. Uh, Clinton said that this act would break the cycle of dependency in America's cities. Clinton found a way to continuously work with Republicans who largely viewed him with disdain. And despite his personal bag, uh, baggage, the American people loved Bill Clinton in the 1990s for this. Clinton presided over a booming economy fueled by emergent computing technologies. Personal computers had skyrocketed in sales and the internet had become a technological and cultural phenomenon. Communication and commerce were never the same. The tech boom was driven by business and the 90s saw robust innovation and entrepreneurship. Investors scrambled to find the, ne the next Microsoft or Apple uh, long before the Xbox or the iPhone. Uh, suddenly massive computing companies making computers. But it was the internet that sparked the bonanza. The dot-com boom, the dot-com tech boom, fueled enormous economic growth and substantial financial speculation in technology stocks leading to a massive, uh, massive valuations that simply couldn't be sustained by actual company earnings. We'll see the stock market balloon up uh, in a sort of bubble and then collapse in the early 2000s. Republicans, defeated at the polls in 1996, looked for other ways to undermine Clinton's presidency. Political polarization seemed unprecedented and a sensation-starved post-Watergate media, now fueled by a 24-hour uh, news cycle, demanded scandal. The culture wars sold. The Republican Congress spent millions on investigations, hoping to uncover some shred of damning evidence to sink Bill Clinton's presidency, whether it be his real estate deals, White House staffers, or alleged adultery. Rumors of sexual misconduct had always swirled around Bill Clinton. The press, which had historically turned a blind eye to such private matters, now saturated the media with Clinton's sex scandals. Congressional investigations targeted the allegations, and Clinton denied having sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky, White House staffer, before a grand jury, and then in a statement to the American people that I remember very uh, vividly. Republicans used the testimony to allege perjury. In the summer of 1998, uh, the House of Representatives voted to impeach the president. He later admitted he had lied. It was a wildly unpopular misstep for the GOP moving to impeach him. Two thirds of the uh, Americans polled disapproved of this Republican effort and a majority told Gallup pollsters that Republicans had abused their constitutional authority in trying to impeach Bill Clinton. Clinton's approval rating, meanwhile, jumped to 78% in February of 1999. Clinton was acquitted by the Senate by a vote that fell mostly along party lines. Bill Clinton was never more popular than when he was acquitted um, and after being impeached by the House. The 2000 presidential election pitted Vice President uh, Al Gore Jr. He's still here against George W. Bush, the twice elected Texas governor and son of the former president, George W. Bush, 43. Gore, uh, quite wary of Clinton's recent impeachment, despite Clinton's enduring approval ratings, distanced himself from the current president and the eight years of relative prosperity that America had enjoyed. Instead, he ran as a pragmatic, moderate liberal. Bush too ran as a moderate, claiming to represent a compassionate conservatism and a new faith-based politics. Bush was an outspoken evangelical Christian. During one of the presidential debates, he declared Jesus Christ as his favorite political philosopher. He promised to bring church leaders into government and his campaign appealed to churches and clergy to get out the vote. Moreover, he promised to bring honor, dignity, and integrity to the, to the Oval Office, a clear reference to Clinton. Utterly lacking the political charisma that had propelled Clinton, Gore withered under Bush's attacks. Instead of trumpeting the Clinton presidency, Gore found himself answering the media's questions about whether he was sufficiently an alpha male and whether he had invented the internet. 
Few elections have been as close and as contentious as the 2000 election, which ended in a virtual deadlock. Gord won the popular vote by half a million votes, but the Electoral College hinged on a contested Florida uh, county re result. On election night, the media called Florida for Gore, but then Bush made late gains later that evening and news organizations reversed themselves by declaring the state for Bush. And that made Bush the probable presidential elect. Gore conceded privately in a phone call to Bush. Then hours later backpedaled as counts uh, edged back toward Gore yet again. When the nation woke up the next day, it was unclear who had won just enough votes to be seated as president. The close Florida vote triggered an automatic recount. Lawyers descended onto Florida. The Gore uh, campaign called for a manual recount in several Florida counties. Local election boards, uh, Florida Secretary of State Kathleen Harris, famous name from that time, and the Florida State Supreme Court all battled to decide the case. Finally, after weeks of indecision, the United States Supreme Court saw an opportunity and stepped in uh, to an affair that had dragged on. In an unprecedented 5-4 decision by the Supreme Court, in Bush versus Gore, Supreme Court decision, so the United States Supreme Court ruled that the recent recounts and investigations had to end and allowed for the previous vote certification to stand. Bush was awarded Florida by a margin of 537 votes. Enough to win him the state and then to give him enough uh, of a majority to win in the Electoral College. Weeks after election day, George W. Bush had won the presidency. Never tell me that your vote does not matter. In the first months of, uh, in office, Bush uh, fought to push forward enormous tax cuts skewed toward America's highest earners. He was sort of a supply sider like Reagan. The bursting of the dot-com bubble, uh, which I mentioned previously, stocks finally started to, to lose steam. Way down the economy in the early days of the, the new millennium. That's an idea I don't mention in my lecture here at all, but this idea of how things could be different in the year 2000 and what was going to happen when we went from 1999 to uh, the year 2000, there was a scare that all the computers would crash called Y2K. It was a very interesting time. So into this new millennium, old political fights and cultural fights continued to be fought, and then the towers fell. On the morning of September 11th, 2001, 9-11, 19 operatives of the Al-Qaeda uh, terrorist organization uh, hijacked four passenger planes on the east coast of the United States. Al-Qaeda. American Airlines Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower of the World Trade Center in New York City just before 9 a.m. United Airlines Flight 175 crashed into the South Tower just minutes later. American Airlines Flight 77 crashed into the western facade of the United States Pentagon roughly 30 minutes later. And just before 10 a.m., the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. Just after 10 a.m., uh, United Airlines Flight 93 crashed in a field outside Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It was brought down by passengers who had received news by a phone uh, of the earlier hijackings. They knew what was about to happen. Just before 10.30 a.m., the North Tower collapsed. In less than two hours, with Americans glued to their television screens, nearly 3,000 Americans had been killed, many forced to jump to their deaths from World Trade Center office windows or be burned alive. American intelligence agencies quickly identified the radical Islamic militant group Al-Qaeda, led by the wealthy Saudi Osama bin Laden, as the perpetrators of these terrorist attacks. Sheltered in Afghanistan, site of that old uh, proxy war with the Soviet Union, um, uh, by the Taliban, the country's Islamic government, Taliban, Al-Qaeda was responsible for the 1993 parking garage bombing under the World Trade Center and a string of attacks on U.S. embassies and military bases across the world across the 1990s. Bin Laden's Islamic radicalism and his anti-American aggression attracted supporters from around the region, fueled by the internet, and by 2001, Al-Qaeda was active in over 60 countries. Although in his presidential campaign, President Bush had denounced foreign nation building, he populated his administration with neoconservatives, firm believers in the expansion of American democracy and American interests abroad. Bush advocated uh, what was sometimes called the Bush Doctrine, a policy in which the United States would have the right to unilaterally and preemptively make war on any regime or terrorist organization that posed a threat to the United States or its U.S. citizens. Bush doctrine. Preemptive war to prevent attack was the idea, Bush doctrine. It would lead the United States into protracted conflicts in Afghanistan and back into Iraq. 
uh, and entangle the United States and uh, nations all across the globe. Journalist Dexter Flickens, Filkins called it a forever war, a perpetual conflict waged by an amorphous and seemingly undefeatable enemy that easily blended in amongst civilians across the Middle East. The geopolitical realities of the 21st century world were forever transformed by 9-11. The United States, of course, had a history in Afghanistan. When the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan in December of 1979 to quell an insurrection that threatened to topple Kabul's communist government, the United States financed and armed anti-Soviet insurgents, the Mujahideen. In 1981, the Reagan administration authorized the CIA to provide the Mujahideen with weapons and training to strengthen their insurgency. An independent, uh, independently wealthy young Saudi named Osama bin Laden also fought with and funded the Mujahideen, and they began to win. The war in Afghanistan bled the Soviet Union dry. The cost of that war, coupled with growing instability at home, convinced the Soviets to withdraw from Afghanistan in 1989. Osama bin Laden relocated Al-Qaeda to Afghanistan after the country fell to the Taliban in 1996. Under Bill Clinton, the United States launched uh, cruise missiles at Al-Qaeda camps in Afghanistan in retaliation for Al-Qaeda bombings on American embassies in Africa. After September 11th, with broad authorization from Congress for the use of military force, Bush administration officials made plans for uh, action against Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. What would become the longest war in American history began with the launching of, the, of Operation Enduring Freedom in October 2001. Air and missile strikes hit targets across Afghanistan. United States Special Forces joined with fighters in the anti-Taliban Northern Alliance. Major Afghan cities fell in quick succession. The capital, Kabul, fell on November 13th. Bin Laden and Al-Qaeda oper uh, operatives retreated into the rugged mountains along the border with Pakistan and Eastern Afghanistan. The American occupation of Afghanistan had begun. As American troops now uh, fought to contain the Taliban in Afghanistan, the Bush administration sets its sights, set its sights on Iraq. After the conclusion of the Gulf War in 1991 under the former President Bush, American officials established economic sanctions, weapon inspections, and no-fly zones. By the middle of 1991, American warplanes were routinely patrolling Iraqi skies and coming under periodic fire from Iraqi uh, missile batteries. On the ground in Iraq, meanwhile, Iraqi authorities clashed with UN weapons inspectors. Iraq had suspended its programs for weapons of mass destruction, WMDs. But Saddam Hussein fostered ambiguity about the weapons very intentionally in the minds of regional leaders to forestall any possible attacks against Iraq. Saddam Hussein always believed that if, if he thought that others believed that there was even a chance that he had nuclear weapons, perhaps they would uh, not invade his country. In 1998, a standoff between Saddam Hussein and, uh, and the United Nations over weapons inspections led President Bill Clinton to launch punitive strikes aimed at uh, destabilizing and debilitating what he thought to be a developed chemical weapons program. Attacks began in late 1998. More than 200 cruise missiles fired from U.S. Navy warships and Air Force B-52 bombers flew into Iraq, targeting suspected chemical weapons storage facilities, missile batteries, and command centers. Airstrikes continued for three days, unleashing a total of 415 cruise missiles and 600 bombs against 97 different targets. The number of bombs dropped was nearly double the number used across the entire 1991 conflict. The United States and Iraq remained at odds throughout the 90s and early 2000 when Bush administration officials championed regime change. The Bush administration publicly denounced Saddam Hussein's regime. I don't know if I've quite mentioned him yet, Saddam Hussein, and its alleged weapons of mass destruction. It began pushing for war in the fall of 2002, after 9-11. The administration, Bush administration, alleged that Hussein was trying to acquire uranium and that it had aluminum tubes used for nuclear centrifuges. Public opinion was divided. George W. Bush, the president, said in October, uh, quote, uh, facing clear evidence of peril, we cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. The administration's push for war was now in full swing. Protests broke out across the country and all over the world. I was a part of them. But majorities of Americans uh, supported military action. I can attest to that. On October 16th, Congress passed the authorization for use of military force against Iraq, um, a resolution giving Bush the power to make war in Iraq. Iraq began cooperating with UN weapons inspectors in late 2002, seeing the writing on the wall. But the Bush administration pressed on. Uh, in fe early February of 2003, Secretary of State Colin Powell, who had risen to public prominence as chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Persian Gulf War in 1991, 
presented allegations of a robust uh, Iraqi weapons program to the United Nations. Protests continued. The first American bombs hit Baghdad on March 20th of 2003. Several hundred thousand American soldiers moved into Iraq and Hussein's regime quickly collapsed. Baghdad fell to the Americans in, on April 9th. On May 1st, aboard the United States, uh, the USS Abraham Lincoln, beneath famously a banner reading, Mission Accomplished, uh, uh, President George W. Bush announced that major combat operations in Iraq had ended. Evidence of the sorts of weapons of mass destruction alleged by Powell and Bush and others in the administration uh, proved elusive to find. And combat operations had not ended, like the president had said. The Iraqi insurgency had actually begun, and the United States would spend the next 10 years struggling to contain it. Efforts by various intelligence agencies uh, led to the capture of Saddam Hussein, hidden in an underground compartment near his hometown on December 13th of 2003. The new Iraqi government found him guilty of crimes against humanity, and he was hanged on December 30th of 2006 with cell phone footage of his hanging uh, playing out across the globe on computer screens, uh, and you know, it's online if you'd like to see it. The War on Terror, as it came to be known, was the centerpiece in the race for the White House in 2004. The Democratic ticket was headed by Massachusetts Senator John F. Kerry, uh, a Vietnam War veteran uh, who had entered the public consciousness for his subsequent congressional testimony against the war. Uh, he attacked Bush for the ongoing instability to contain the insurgency in Iraq, to find the weapons of mass destruction, for the revela uh, revelation and photographic evidence that American soldiers were uh, terrorizing and abusing uh, prisoners in the Abu Ghraib prison outside of Baghdad, and for the inability to actually find Osama bin Laden, the perpetrator, uh, the mastermind of 9-11. Moreover, many enemy combatants who had been captured in Iraq and Afghanistan were detained indefinitely at a military prison in Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, Gitmo, as it came to be known, became infamous for its harsh treatment, indefinite detentions, and torture of prisoners. Bush defended the war on terror in 2004, and his allies uh, attacked critics for failing to support the troops. Moreover, Kerry had voted for the war as a United States Senator. Uh, he had to attack the very thing that he had authorized in this, in this campaign. Bush won a close but clear victory. The second Bush term saw the continued deterioration of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, but Bush's presidency would take an even bigger hit from his perceived failure to respond to the domestic tragedy that followed Hurricane Katrina's devastating hit on the Gulf Coast and on New Orleans specifically, Hurricane Katrina. Katrina had been a Category 5 hurricane. It was the New Orleans times picayune and reported the storm we always feared. New Orleans suffered a direct hit. The levees broke, the levees protecting the city. Uh, from the flood water, and the bulk of the sea was flooded. Thousands of refugees flocked to the Superdome, um, where supplies and medical treatment and evacuation were slow to come. Individuals died in the heat, bodies wasted away. Americans saw poor blacks fending off looters and the elements without uh, ready support. Katrina became a symbol of broken government systems like FEMA, a devastated coastline and irreplaceable social structures that allowed um, escape and uh, recovery for some and not for others. Immigration, meanwhile, had become an increasingly potent political issue. The Clinton administration had overseen the implementation of several anti-immigration policies on the U.S.-Mexico border, but hunger and poverty were stronger incentives than border enforcement policies were deterrents. Illegal immigration continued, often at a great human cost, but nevertheless fanned widespread anti-immigration sentiment among many American conservatives. Policy solutions proved elusive, though. Moderate conservatives feared upsetting business interests demand for cheap labor and alienating large voting blocks by stifling immigration. And moderate liberals feared upsetting anti-immigrant groups by pushing too hard for liberalization of immigration laws. Afghanistan and Iraq, meanwhile, continued to fall apart. In 2006, the Taliban reemerged as the Afghan government proved both highly corrupt and incapable of providing social services or security for its citizens. Iraq only descended further into chaos as insurgents battled against American troops and groups like uh, al Zawari's al-Qaeda in Iraq bombed civilians and released video recordings of the symbolic beheadings of soldiers and journalists who were captured. In 2007, 27,000 additional U.S. forces deployed to Iraq under the command of General David Petraeus. The effort, which was called the Surge, employed more sophisticated anti-insurgency strategies and, combined with Sunni efforts, uh, pacified many of Iraqi cities uh, and provided cover for the withdrawal of American forces. 
On December 4, 2008, the Iraqi government approved the U.S.-Iraq Status of Forces Agreement, and U.S. combat forces withdrew from Iraqi cities beginning on June 30, 2009. The last U.S. combat forces left Iraq on December 18, 2011. Violence and instability continue to plague the country as Americans once again left a foreign battlefield, disillusioned by uncertain outcomes and making sense of the untold costs. The Great Recession began as most American economic catastrophes do with the bursting of a great speculative bubble. Throughout the 1990s and into the new millennium, home prices across the country continued to climb. The American families, banks, and investment holders looked to cash in on what seemed to be a safe but lucrative investment. After the dot-com bubble had burst, um, investors searched for a secure investment rooted in clear value rather than in trendy technological stock speculation. What could be more secure than real estate? But mortgage companies began uh, writing increasingly risky loans and then bundling them together and selling them in packages over and over again, sometimes so quickly that it became difficult to determine exactly which bundles of mortgage-backed securities were safe investments in which were simply junk full of mortgages that people actually couldn't pay. Mortgages perhaps that people had taken out as speculation themselves, a second home, a third home as an effort to flip and to try to make money in this crazy real estate market. Coupled with massive government programs built to subsidize risky mortgages for people with poor credit, once the dominoes of the U.S. housing market fell, they fell hard. Mortgages had been so heavily leveraged that when American homeowners began to default on their loans, when folks simply couldn't pay for that second mortgage anymore, or even perhaps their first mortgage, the whole economic system within the United States teetered toward collapse. Major financial services firms like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers disappeared almost overnight. In order to prevent the crisis from spreading, the federal government poured billions of dollars into the industry, propping up hobbled banks. Massive giveaways to bankers prompted shockwaves of resentment throughout the country. On the political right, conservative members of this new Tea Party movement, which seemed to come out of nowhere, decried the cronyism of an Obama administration filled with former Wall Street executives. The same energies also motivated the Occupy Wall Street movement, as mostly young left-leaning New Yorkers protested an American economy that seemed overwhelmingly uh, tilted toward the 1% at the expense of the 90 Nine percent, they call themselves. While American banks stabilized and the American stock market began to climb again to all new highs, American workers continued to lag in the recovery that would follow this recession. Job growth was slow and unemployment rates would remain stubbornly high for years. Wages froze as a result and a generation of workers coming of age within this crisis were savaged by um, the economic collapse. Unemployment young, uh, among young Americans hovered for years at rates which nearly doubled the national average, which led many students to take out inordinate amounts of loan debt poorly matched to their actual future job prospects. By the 2008 presidential election, with Iraq still in chaos, Democrats were ready to embrace the anti-war position and sought a candidate who had consistently opposed military action in Iraq versus John Kerry, who had supported it before he voted against it. Senator Barack Obama, I think just a one-term Senator Barack Obama, had only been a member of the Illinois State Senate when Congress debated the war actions, but he had publicly denounced the war, predicting that sec uh, sectarian violence would ensue. And he, rema uh, he remained critical of the invasion through his 2004 uh, campaign for the United States Senate. He began running for pr uh, the presidency almost immediately after arriving in Washington as a first-term senator. A former law professor and community activist Obama became the first African-American candidate to ever capture the nomination of a major political party. During the election, Obama won the support of an increasingly anti-war electorate. When an already fragile economy finally collapsed in 2007, 2008, Bush's policies were widely blamed. Obama's opponent, uh, uh, the for, uh, Republican Senator and former POW um, and now deceased John McCain tied to those policies and he struggled to fight off uh, the nation's desire for a new political direction. Obama won a convincing victory in the fall and became the nation's first African-American president. President Obama's first term was marked uh, by domestic affairs, especially his efforts to combat the Great Recession and to pass a national health care law. Obama came into office as the economy continued to deteriorate. He continued to um, uh, the bank bailout began under President Bush and launched a massive economic stimulus plan $700 billion, let's write that out, 700,000 million 
billion. Uh, Taxpayer Assistance and Recovery Act, TARP. In an attempt to use government spending to try to stimulate the national economy, he is a Keynesian for sure. Having won that 2008 election handily and with a lot of support from even some conservatives who thought Obama represented in a new way with his yes we can, si se puede, change was the idea that Barack Obama represented and so he was a very popular figure in 2008. He decided to spend that weighty political capital on the health care issue as opposed to immigration as some had hoped, as I had hoped. Obama's uh, dominant electoral victory quickly moved into the rear view mirror. National politics fractured and a conservative, uh, conservative Republican firewall quickly rose against the Obama administration. A Tea Party movement became a catch-all term for a diffuse movement of fiercely conservative and politically frustrated American voters. Tea Party activists registered their deep suspicions of federal government spending and their protests dominated the public eye across 2009. Activists steered the Republican Party to the right, shifting primary elections all across the country and seizing control of the United States House of uh, Representatives in a stinging rebuke to Obama's platform just two years into his presidency. In 2010, he called it, Obama called it a shellacking when he was so popular in 2008 and then by introducing the health care law legislation and, and using that as his signature um, policy you know, push, um, he lost the House of Representatives and he lost his control over the government. Barack Obama's most substantive legislative achievement proved to be his national health care law, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, most commonly known as Obamacare. Beset by conservative efforts to stop it, Obama's health care reform narrowly passed through Congress. It abolished pre-existing conditions as a cause for denying care, scrapped junk plans, and provided for state-run health care exchanges, allowing individuals without health care to pool their purchasing power. It offered state funds to subsidize an expansion of Medicaid if they wanted it and required all Americans to provide proof of health insurance um, that measured up to government established standards. Those who did not purchase a plan would pay a penalty tax to the IRS and those who could not afford insurance would be eligible for federal subsidies. If that sounds complicated, it was. It was a 2000 page law. The number of uninsured Americans remained stubbornly high despite the law, however, and conservatives spent most of the next decade attacking and attempting to weaken the law through the United States court system. Nearly 10 years after the September 11th attacks, in May of 2001, US Navy Sea, Air, and Land Forces, the SEALs, conducted a raid deep into Pakistan that finally led to the killing uh, of Osama bin Laden. The United States and NATO began a phased withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2001, with an aim of removing all combat troops by 2014. Although weak militarily, the Taliban remained politically influential in South and Eastern Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda remained active in Pakistan. In the 2012 presidential election, with most of the Tea Party energy muted as a result of their congressional Republican sweep in 2010, and again, they're gonna win more seats in 2012, Barack Obama used sophisticated computer-driven neighborhood level voting data to help him win a second presidential term by defeating Republican Mitt Romney, uh, the former governor of Massachusetts. However, Obama's inability to take back Congress amid the ascendancy of the Tea Party Republicans stunted further passage of significant legislation. Obama was a lame duck before he ever won re-election and gridlock government came to represent an acute sense uh, that much of American life, whether in politics, economics, or race relations had grown stagnant. Climate change became a permanent and major topic of public discussion and policy in the early 21st century. Fueled by popular coverage, most no notably perhaps the documentary film, An Inconvenient Truth, based on Al Gore's book uh, and his presentations in the same name, uh, addressing climate change became a, a plank of the American left and a point of debate for the American right. Conservative politicians and think tanks continue to oppose federal action on the topic, accusing Democrats of simply wishing to use this crisis to pursue otherwise uh, unpopular liberal legislative priorities. By 2016, American voters were fed up. In that year's presidential race, Republicans spurned their political establishment and nominated a real estate developer and celebrity billionaire, Donald J. Trump, who decrying the tyranny of political correctness and promising to make America great again, pledged to build a wall to keep out Mexican immigrants and to ban uh, Muslim immigration from war-torn countries. The Democrats, meanwhile, flirted with the uh, candidacy of self-described socialist Senator Bernie Sanders uh, from Vermont before ultimately nominating Hillary Clinton, this, the party standard, 
who after two terms as first lady in the 90s had served eight years in the Senate and uh, four more as Secretary of State under Barack Obama. Voters despaired. Trump and Clinton were the most unpopular nominees in modern American history. Majorities of Americans viewed each candidate unfavorably, and majorities in both parties said early in their election season that they were motivated by uh, more to vote against their rival candidate than for their own candidate. With income, incomes largely frozen, politics gridlocked, school shootings in the news, and race relations tense, such frustrations only channeled a larger sense of stagnation, which upset traditional political allegiances. In the end, despite winning uh, nearly 3 million more votes nationwide, Clinton failed to carry uh, key Midwestern states um, where frustrated white working class voters abandoned the Democratic Party for the first time in a generation. A Republican president hadn't carried Wisconsin, Michigan, or Pennsylvania since Ronald Reagan and swung their support to the Republicans. Donald Trump had shocked the world and won in the American presidency. Political divisions only deepened after his election. A nation already uh, deeply split by income, culture, race, geography, and ideology continued to come apart. Trump's presidency uh, consumed national attention. Even those who despised him could not look away. All forms of media, producers and consumers alike, and the advertisers who accompanied the spectacle could not help but throw themselves at the ins and outs of Trump's norm-smashing first years as president, while seemingly refracting every major national event, including an impeachment trial in the House through the prism of the Trump presidency. Donald Trump rapidly reversed the policies of the Obama years with gusto and pursued Reagan-esque policy initiatives, income tax cuts, deregulation, etc., by surrounding himself with a revolving cast of old guard, big government conservatives. As the U.S. stock market took off like a rocket ship um, and the U.S. federal deficit accelerated even faster than under his predecessor, 20, I haven't checked in a few days, 25,000 million billion, trillion dollars, the United States federal deficit as of this recording. The United States was faced with a coronavirus pandemic in early 2020, COVID-19, that shuttered most of the global economy and killed hundreds of thousands of Americans uh, with the full economic fallout still yet to be faced at the time of this recording. Yesterday, uh, Donald Trump, the American president, uh, contracted COVID-19. Rapidly liberalizing social attitudes toward homosexuality define the rapid change uh, of culture shift in the first decade of the, of the new century here. Same-sex marriage uh, had been sort of a, a plank in the culture wars and sort of a, a line of division. That line has, seems to have ended as the culture wars seem to have shifted. Um, that debate sort of culminated and finally ended with the Obergefell versus Hodges Supreme Court gay marriage decision in 2015, Obergefell versus Hodges. Despite that shift, nothing defined young Americans in this era more than their embrace of technology. The internet in particular, liberated from desktop modems, shaped more of daily life than ever before in this century. The release of the Apple iPhone in 2007, the iPhone, popularized the concept of smartphones for millions of consumers. And by 2011, about a third of Americans owned a mobile computing device. Four years later, uh, in 2015, two thirds did. Together with the advent of social media, Americans use their smartphones and their desktop computers to and their laptop computers and their tablets and their smartwatches to stay in touch with old acquaintances, chat with friends, share photos, and interpret the world as new newspaper and magazine subscriptions dwindled. Americans increasingly turned to their social media networks for news and information in this era. The easy accessibility of video capturing and the ability for stories to go viral outside of traditional media, for instance, brought new attention to the tense and often conflicted relationships between municipal police officers and African Americans. The 2014 death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri focused the issue, and over the following years, videos documenting the deaths of black men in police custody circulated uh, widely among social media networks. It became a testament to the power of social media platforms such as Twitter that a hashtag, Black Lives Matter, could become a rallying cry for protesters and counter hashtags, All Lives Matter or Police Lives Matter for its critics, Black Lives Matter. Another social media phenomenon, the Me Too movement, hashtag Me Too, began as the magnification of an outrage toward the alleged past sexual crimes of notable male celebrities and political figures, Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, Bill Cosby, R. Kelly, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Brett Kavanaugh, et cetera, before injecting a greater intolerance toward those accused of sexual harassment and violence into much of the rest of American society. I'm recording this um, 
I think just like 30 days before the 2020 general election, um, where we'll elect you know, a new president. Uh, and uh, once again, uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, are warning of social, political, cultural, and spiritual ruination if their party doesn't win. My memory just barely stretches back to that first Gulf War, 1991. But I was a witness to and occasionally a participant in all of the major American historical events that have followed that event. If all that I have read, seen, learned, and unlearned about American history in the uh, past 30 years has taught me anything, it's that America is on the move. This is a country that tears old things down in order to remake itself anew. The price we pay for this sort of progress is a sort of churning and cacophonous national tumult. I urge you to seek balance within this uncertainty and disarray and avoid getting too swept up in it as the winds of destiny will soon change directions again. One can find all of this churning quite vexing, of course, but you can choose to, uh, you can choose to fight uh, to shape the chaos if you'd like. And here in these United States of America, you are quite free to make your own choices for good or ill. And then the stream of history changes its course. Trends shift, things change, events turn. What was unthinkable is now the norm. New generations bring with them new perspectives and they share new ideas into an old world. Your generation will become the old generation and your ideas will be swept out with the tide. Our world is not foreordained. It is the product of our history, that ever evolving culmination of a longer and broader story of a raw, distinctive and unceasing American yaw. No, we can, that's good.